Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this Legal Issues webinar series. Uh, we appreciate having you. My name is John Logan with NCEA. Uh, welcome to this session. Um, today our session is Fundraising Success, Solving the Mystery in the Midst of Two Pandemics. And this will be presented by Sister Rosemary Nassif, Executive Director of the Center for Catholic Education at Loyola Marymount University. We're very grateful to have uh, sister with us today, uh, take the time to come on and share her resources with us. And before we get going, uh, let's begin with a short prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for this opportunity to learn and grow, uh, uh, to grow into our mission in Catholic education. Um, we entrust our, our time uh, to you, and we ask you to bless our presenter and everyone joining us today, uh, as well as for the rest of the event. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before I pass it off to Sister Rosemarie, we just have a couple housekeeping items for you. We encourage you to check out all of the other sessions and more information for this series on the event right page. We also welcome your feedback. So if you'd like to share your experience with us, please complete the post-session evaluation for this webinar and others, which you can access on the Eventbrite page as well. Uh, certificates of attendance will be available uh, after completing the evaluation. Once again, thank you so much for joining us and it's my pleasure to pass it off to Sister. Thanks, Sister. You're welcome and thank you, jo Jonathan, for the opening prayer and for the introduction. Good morning to all of you and welcome as Jonathan indicated, I'm Sister Rosemary Nassif. I'm a school sister of Notre Dame, and I'm executive director at the LMU Center for Catholic Education. I wanna first and foremost, thank you for being here. Thank you for being present in mind and spirit wherever your body is located. And I truly believe and trust that all of us, all of us are connected together. This has been more than a challenging last five months in the world and in the world of Catholic education. It has been Herculean, demanding and stretching. And I first want to say congratulations to all of you. You have survived and hopefully more than survived. You have survived to prepare for and live another school year. I congratulate you. And I commend you because you are choosing to be more than you were BP before pandemics. You would not be tuned into this presentation if that were not your choice. I am committed to assist you in that choice to become more through some small nuggets of insight this morning on solving the mystery of fundraising success in the midst of two pandemics. The origin of the word pandemic is Greek, pan meaning all and demos meaning people. We in the United States, in our church, in our schools are experiencing two pandemics simultaneously, COVID-19 and a heightened awareness of racism. One is as old as our nation, the other is relatively recent and both have changed and are changing each of us. Both have turned our world of education upside down and inside out. Both are changing the world of philanthropy and fundraising. And that's our conversation this morning. It is providential that we are gathering today around fundraising on July 8th, which marks the birthday of John D. Rockefeller in 1839, industrialist, founder of Standard Oil, and one of the world's richest men. He summed up the prevalent model of the free enterprise, enterprise system when he said, God gave me my money, which I hope was the belief that motivated him to give it away. I believe the total assets today of the Rockefeller Foundation, 83 years after he passed away, are around $5 billion. So as we go 
to the world of fundraising, there are three commandments, and they're really very important to our understanding of how to achieve success. Leadership, relationships, and impact. And whenever you approach a funder or write a proposal, just remember these three commandments. Have them in the front of your lens and in the background of your thinking. When I was at the Conrad Hilton Foundation, which was prior uh, to my present role, I had a rule, always give to leadership. Great leadership is always what attracted me and I believe what attracts other funders. No matter the strategy, no matter how good the strategy is, a good leader will always deliver a great impact. The leader does not always have to be the chief or the boss or even the principal or the superintendent. It could be a teacher who is the project manager, who is a terrific leader and will deliver confidence in the mind of the donor that the project will have the desired impact. I've had the privilege in my past life of being president of two Catholic universities, one on the East Coast and one here in California. And it was probably me as president who got the donor in the door. But most of the time, it was not me, the president, who got the donor to commit. Often, it was the faculty who were passionate, committed, smart, and driven to deliver all the results of great impact that were the, lin the linchpins of the funding. And sometimes the students are the emotional hook for the funders. So always remember that. Don't eliminate your students from your approach because funders love students. Even when you overlay the world of pandemics, these three remain the commandments. Leadership, relationships, and impact. However, how you engage them or work with them may have some differences before pandemics and now in pandemics. So when we go to look at philanthropy and fundraising, there's somewhat of a little distinction between two no nomenclature words around this. Uh, there's a distinction between a philanthropist and a philanthropist. Philanthropists usually earn the funds themselves. For instance, Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller would be a, ph a philanthropist. They have strong emotional connections to their grantees. They're very relationship focused. It, you, 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 you get the heart of, of the philanthropist. Uh, when I worked at the Conrad Hilton Foundation, Conrad Hilton himself, of course, had passed away, but his heart was still within the culture of the foundation, and he loved Catholic sisters. The Hilton Foundation is not a Catholic foundation, but it gives the majority of its assets to our Catholic sisters who are doing great work all over the world. And that was in the last will and testament of Conrad Hilton. Philanthropists have strong net networks and they're willing to make big bets. Philanthropists, they steward the family resources. So our board members at the Hilton Foundation are the board members of a big foundation today like the Rockefeller Foundation. They'll be a philanthropist, and they're bound by the donor intent. They can interpret the donor intent across a strategy. Uh, philanthropists are usually engaged in strategic directions. And what they want to do is to change the need. A, ph a philanthropist might want to meet the need. So uh, there's a little difference here between uh, the, the direction of a, th of a philanthropist and what will compel a, a philanthropist. So in looking at moving forward with this, how do we strengthen relationships today? with our COVID-19 uh, pandemic that of course has isolated us in many ways from each other. We build relationships today via Zoom. Zoom is great. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here with all of you because of Zoom. 
Uh, and uh, the, uh, the other reality of Zoom though, is that I won't necessarily get, as, uh, ab get able to know you as well on a personal level. So building a new relationship with the funder today, only through Zoom, is very difficult to do. We focus today more on the relationships that we already have. So when you look at a need that you have and you want to go to a donor, my suggestion is that you go to those donors who've been faith faithful to you all, all along. So how we maintain and strengthen the relationships that we have is very important through Zoom. Uh, many locales may be open in terms of being with the donor at lunch, but you know, we're cutting back on that now because of the spike in COVID-19. So again, our suggestion at this time is to really focus on uh, the present relationships that, that you have with the donor, but be very careful about that relationship. Don't take it for granted. Always connect with your present donors, the ones who are with you, the ones who are faithful to you. Uh, ask them how they are, how their foundation is doing, and what they're doing now in terms of their grant making. Uh, so that relationship factor with your, you, with your present donor in, in, in this pandemic environment is to maintain contact, maintain contact, and listen to your present donor in terms of what they're interested in with the realities today and how their, how their philanthropy or foundation is doing. These present donors will most, high, most likely be your prospects for any future uh, grant, grant making. So you stay in touch and make sure you listen. Also, make sure your present donors know how your school is responding to the COVID-19 cha challenges. If you've turned around your classroom instruction to online instruction in 72 hours, which I've heard that many of our Catholic schools have done. If you've accessed iPads for families who don't have an iPad so that their students, their children uh, can learn easily and readily with the online environment. If you've been online teaching for a full day, because as we know, some of the teachers do it maybe half a day and then they depend more on the parents for the other half of the day. So let your donors know all these stellar things that you're doing in converting the whole educational dynamic into online learning. Or if you've distributed lunches to families that uh, you know are in need and perhaps not even ask them, do they go to your school? That you just know that they're there because they need food for their, for, for their uh, children. Or if you've received a PPP loan, I mean, that was pretty arduous to apply for, and many of our Catholic schools, if not uh, most of them, have received the PPP loans. And if 98% of your students are active in online learning, that you touch base with those families, and that every family is personally contacted every week, that you've divided up all the families in your school among your staff, so that each family gets a personal, a personal contact, just to know how they are, how their uh, children are doing in terms of learning, how can we better support you? So that personal contact is really a part of the Catholic mission. Your donors wanna know that you're taking that kind of interest. If you're farming uh, the community, if you're keeping the community together, isn't that a real relished asset of Catholic education that we really maintain a community contact? And if you're praying together as a community, if you're inviting the families, your school families, to join in prayer together before the school day, maybe at midday, or even for special occasions, to join in prayer together. Your donors want to know that you're maintaining that, those essence pieces of your mission. And if you're really pulling out the lessons on Catholic social teaching. How are you utilizing the lessons on Catholic social teaching, the sacredness of every person, the dignity of the person uh, for all, the dignity of the person is kind of the foundation for all of Catholic, uh, of the principles of Catholic social teaching. And how, how significant is that today with our 
huge awareness of racism in our nation. Across race, across culture, across ethnicity, social background, we are a community. Your donors want to know that you're allowing students to engage in that re relevant reality. These are the leaders of the future that you're helping to both inform and develop. So that, and that people, all of us share and help each other. So highlight a checklist of achievements on your website, tout. You want donors to be proud of their giving and proud of you for being a great leader and a great marketer of how you're responding to all the two pandemics today in our nation. So what is the COVID-19 impact on charitable giving and on donor giving? Uh, there was a study that was done by an organization called Fidelity Charitable, which is the, law, the largest donor advised fund organization in the United States. And what do donor advised fund organizations do is they uh, hold the monies of the donor in kind of a, a chest and they learn the donor's intent and they assist the donor in allowing them to know where are some opportunities for them to give that really match their intent. So they did a huge survey of charitable giving. And two of the pieces of good news that they found out is that 25% of donors plan to increase their donations. They're feeling the great need with the COVID-19 and even the racism pandemics. They're feeling a great need. Uh, and they're often doing the extra amounts of giving to those that meet the particular needs that are aligned with our two pandemics. 54% of the donors plan to maintain their levels of giving. So over 79% of the donors are, even, are either maintaining or, increase, or increasing their giving. I, I have here a link to this whole uh, 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 survey that was done by Fidelity Ch Charitable. If you want to highlight that link, it, it will be, I believe, on um, the NCEA uh, web regarding information from this particular session. So if you want to go to that link, please join it and see what else you can learn uh, from that survey done by Fidelity Char Charitable. And again, as I said, uh, this is a particular piece of good news uh, for all of us who are, who are seeking monies from uh, generous philanthropists and philanthropers. Now, there, there is a reality, too, that donors today are conservative in ter terms of giving large amounts, like multi-million dollar gifts, are committing to long-term giving. Uh, and in, in, in the recent reality, they were willing to give over three years to commit to a three-year uh, grant. But today, because of the stock market in instability, they really understand that their corpus, their endowment, is, is in jeopardy. And because there are unknowns in terms of when will this end? When will our pandemics come to some kind of a reality that we're able to live with it, live with, or in some way recover? Recover. When will recovery occur? So because of that, they're, they're a little more conservative uh, in terms of giving large amounts. Uh, and among the most critical needs, when you look at the critical needs that donors are willing to give to, healthcare, human services, education, they see all of these as basic needs. So our Catholic schools are certainly among the critical needs that donors see today within the COVID-19 environment. And also for donors, for many of them, Maintaining equity among families is a priority. They really understand that often those families that suffer equity, whether it's social economic equity, whether it's uh, in influential equ equity, those that suffer equity are suffering the most in both of these pandemics. They are the true people that uh, donors really want to in some way assure, are the, the poor families having all they need for their children to learn? 
Are they getting the kind of care for their children so that some of them can work? And are they unemployed? Are, are they the ones who are suffering the unemployment realities in our families? Uh, so that equity piece is a piece that donors are very much interested in. Do they have Wi-Fi connection where they are? Do they have the technology that they need? Often foundations and donors today are redirecting previous funding. So they may have a particular pro program where that funding was very critical and resourceful to keep it going. But now in this environment, perhaps that direction cannot be maintained in some way or is not the priority of the grantee. The priority of the grantee may have shifted because of all the issues that have been impacted by the COVID-19 disruptions or by the racism reality. It may have gone to a lower sense of priority. So they're very open to redirecting their funding and they want, they're willing to leave it up to the grantee. Most of them have good relationships, they trust the leadership and they're willing to allow that leadership to redirect the funding. Also uh, in the more recent realities, funders have been very, uh, what I would say, uh, not as well um, understanding of the need for unrestricted gifts. They've always wanted to have some program that they know they can measure the impact of that program. Whereas unrestricted gifts are giving the uh, total influence and selection uh, power uh, to the leader in the organization. Now, if they trust that leader, they may have been willing to do un unrestricted gifts in the past, but now they're much more open to it. And they're open to it because, as you know, every day changes. Your needs may change every day because each day uh, there comes a different need or a different priority or a different emphasis. So they're willing to give more unrestricted gifts to the leadership that they trust among their partners and grantees. They're also willing to give to general operations. In the past, donors have, have uh, somewhat shied away from just general operations. Uh, they've been wanting to do the extra things that organizations want to achieve, not necessarily the day-to-day -day things or, or just pay for the present personnel. But today, now in the COVID-19 impact, they are very willing, much more willing to give to general operations because they know that the funding, the general funding for the organizations that they love and they believe in is limited today, especially with regard to education. Are, it's, are, are their organization is being overpowered by need today? Uh, and they also know that, especially for Catholic schools, uh, there's a great limit on how families are able to provide tuition. And with the whole new online learning piece, the motivation of families to maintain tuition is probably less. And so they are willing to give to general operations. So don't be afraid to ask for those kinds of grants from the donors that have already uh, made a great tie or friendship with you. So if, when you go to uh, uh, really achieve a direction uh, and you need resources, how do you develop your case? We talk about the case, the case statement, and the, which is the pitch. You include who, and you always want to highlight your credibility as, as a leader. What, what have you achieved at your school? Or what have you achieved in your diocese? That you are a deliverer. You are a deliverer. Uh, why of this particular case? What problem are you solving? Our need you are address, addressing now? And connecting it to the COVID-19 reality or the racism reality is a hook today because donors see that as two tremendous issues that we're all dealing with. So how, what your problem that you're solving is connected to helping to address that need uh, gives the donor some confidence. Confidence in you that you're really on the page, on the page, and confidence in your donor that they're really assisting the situation of highest priority. What, what is your unique solution now? What are you trying to do now that is unique? different perhaps from what other schools are doing. And how, how will you innovate? What does innovation look like now? 
and especially now, given the two pandemics? And what are, is the impact that you are achieving and the results? So th that's how you develop your case or your pitch. Who, why, what, how, impact, and results. And remember, leadership, relationships, and impact. They should all be woven into your pitch. Leadership, relationships, and impact. And donors always want to know how your impact is going to help students. That students don't shy away from putting students in the front line with your donors. Students can be extremely compelling. They hit the heart of the donor and they hit the emotional need that is out there, especially if I would imagine the problem you want to solve is going to really impact uh, many of your students. So, and, and if these are students who really um, are students that you believe deserve equity in learning, equity in influence, e equity in being able to develop to the fullness of their potentials, then those are the students you want to, hi to highlight. So make sure that students get in the picture. They can be the most compelling element of your pitch. And then you complete your proposal. And really, it's very simple. You do your homework. What is the issue and need? Why is this timely today? Who else is doing this work? Make sure you know who else is doing the work and you uh, uh, allow your donor to know that. Uh, it's not like you're doing it in the dark. And how does this align with the foundation strategy? Or how does this align with the emotional hook of the philanthropist or the foundation strategy? What emotional need is this filling? I'll, don't forget the heart in this. There's, there's the head reality of what you want to achieve and there's the heart. And you know, COVID-19 and racism have hit our hearts, have hit our hearts and our hearts have translated it to our heads. So, Always remember that the heart is important in your proposal and in your pitch. All right, how do, you, how do you deliver impact? Well, first of all, again, as I indicated before, leadership is extremely important. Any, it, it may not be the strategy that really aligns with the donor's uh, uh, understanding of the impact. It may be the leadership that the donor really believes in this, this leader will swim beyond what is expected. I'll get more than what I expect from this particular uh, pro programmatic dimension. And always remember, donors look for impact over outputs. It's not how many iPads you delivered to families who needed iPads. It's how those iPads influenced the learning. How, how those iPads allowed students to, uh, in, in the families to really be 98% present uh, to their online lear learning. So that presence to learning, that impacting learning, and how those students were able to achieve what was expected of the goal of that lesson. How many more students achieved that goal or went beyond that goal? So impact is going beyond the goal of what uh, you have really wanted the program to uh, assist in achieving. So not how many I iPads you delivered, but how those iPads assisted in achieving greater learning, achieving greater connection uh, to, the, the, to the intended lessons. That's the impact. That's the impact. It's, uh, we're not looking at the outputs. And you know, surprise over intended is always fun to achieve. And to put it in your impact uh, reality of, of, of how you uh, report on your grant making impact. Uh, I know when I was at the Hilton Foundation, we developed what was called National Catholic, uh, National Catholic Sisters Week, which um, uh, was the first week in March in Women's History Month, because I wanted to really uh, align sisters with the whole reality of the history of women in our world and in our nation, of course. And also uh, we aligned it with International Women's Day so that to realize that sisters are an international reality. There are 750,000 sisters all, all, all over the world. And we wanted National Catholic Sisters Week to really be a way 
uh, to let people know more about where sisters are because you know we don't wear habits today so sometimes we're not recognized uh, either in our ministries or in just being attentive to people so uh, our, 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 in our parishes. So how do people recognize sisters or even know what sisters are doing today? Now, the surprise that happened is that the sisters got more engaged in really promoting what they were doing. That was the, uh, uh, that was the surprise. So when you look at your impact, if there's a surprise reality, a surprise impact that occurred, make sure you outline that when you report on uh, the reality of your grant. Uh, that surprise can be very, very, very uh, enticing for the donor. And again, when you look at the impact, always know how it has impacted your students. The students get the heart of the donor. So always highlight what has happened to students as the result of your grant. Here we have these students. And you know, our Catholic schools really do uh, promote the reality that our Catholic schools, Catholic education is very excellent at uh, educating not, not only the whole student, but as assuring that all students graduate uh, from high school and go on to college. And we monitor the students to see how they complete college. And our Catholic education reality is very good at assuring donors that however they give to our Catholic schools, these students are not only going to go to college, but they're going to graduate from college. So in looking at all of this and in making sure that students are in the picture, I, I wanna give you two examples of what I call a good pitch. I recently got a fundraising letter from the school uh, where I, from which I graduated. And I, uh, this, is, this was my high school in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, no, Notre Dame High School. And I want to read you just a couple of points in this letter. And this was uh, called the Foundation for the Future COVID-19 Tuition Relief Fund. Uh, really hooking into the reality that people are understanding that some families are so stressed financially, they need assistance to assure that their sons and daughters are going to the right school for them, the right Catholic school for them. And so a tuition relief fund is, I, I believe, it's very attractive to donors, especially to alumni donors. And I believe this was going to all of their present donors as well as to all of their alumni. And I'm, I'm an, uh, an alumna of this school. It's a all women's high school in St. Louis, Missouri. And a, a couple of lines I want to read you from this letter, which hooked me. One is, this, this is the line, and I, I highlighted them on this slide. Notre Dame takes great pride in being able to meet the needs of our students through all of life's challenges. When they need us, we stand beside them. Great line. Great line. When all is said and done, this is another great line, when all is said and done, we will not recall this, the disruptions to everyday life, but we will think of who was at our side. Your support will be forever remembered by a student in need. A great hook, a great emotional hook. And that is so true, isn't it? When all is said and done, we won't think necessarily of the disruptions, but we will recall who was at our side. They also enclosed another page, which I did not put on a slide. And the, other, the, the second page was testimonies from two parents and a testimony from one of the alums. Uh, one of the parents says, they profess and live their school mission daily. The other parent says, Notre Dame has been everything we could want for our daughter. It is filled with wonderful, caring people who have guided her on her journey to being a confident, well-educated, faith-filled, and socially conscious, socially conscious young woman. What about the leadership that they are developing for the future in our world? What about that leadership? 
Also, another idea, don't forget Giving Tuesday. You know, there is a Giving Tuesday right after Thanksgiving. And uh, also, I think in National Catholic Schools Week this past year, they had a Giving Tuesday in that week. Start early, have a goal, a campaign, secure a matching gift that can always be a hook to a donor. If they know that whatever they give is going to be matched or double matched. So secure a matching gift from one of your prominent donors. Uh, messaging, put your messaging and logos on your website, email your community that this is coming, give them a hint that this is coming, highlight students on Facebook and on your website, make students your hook, make your students your hook, and use social media, countdown days with graphics, only five days to Giving Tuesday, only five hours to Giving Tuesday, and prepare your thank yous to go out. So those are two ideas as we go forward and as you go for forward. Uh, I, I want to close with a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I do want to close with a little summary that it's leadership, relationship, and impact. Remember those three, leadership, these three remain the commandments, however, you engage them or work with them, may have some difference in these two pandemics. But those are the commandments as you go forward now for your grant making, as you continue to look at your grant making for now. I'd like to now close with a prayer. This is a prayer from the Novena in honor of St. Catherine Drexel. And, uh, I love St. Cat Catherine Drexel. She is considered the patron saint of philanthropy. She came from a very wealthy family, gave it all up, and used her monies for racial justice for the poor in starting schools for Native Americans and for African Americans. She actually uh, inaugurated and is the foundress of the Blessed Sacrament community which is the first community of sisters of African-American women. She was the founder of that congregation, the Blessed Sacrament Sisters. So I thought she would be a very hopeful and appropriate saint to bring to our attention today. And I invite you to pray this with me. You can unmute yourselves if you're muted. I just invite us all to pray together this prayer. Ever loving God, you called St. Catherine Drexel to teach the message of the gospel and to bring the Holy Eucharist to all people. By her prayers and example, enable us to help those in need. Bring us all into the common communion of your church, that we may be one in you. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And let us say together, Amen. Blessings on all of you. And thank you to each of you for your call to Catholic education. Amen and thank you.